let's get into it. So, as we said before, one of the hallmarks of global weirding is that things are going to be changing. And it's not always entirely clear how those things will be changing. We'll see some examples in, in a second. But, but one example is um, the, the types and abundance of fish that we see and the distribution of fish that we see off of our coast. And so we see various shifts, in, including um, ground fish and pelagic species, a whole host of critters. The other thing that's important to say is not only are we seeing changes in, uh, in you know, who we have off our coast, but it's really important, and this, this is one that's, I think, really hard to understand. I struggle with understanding this in many cases. It's important to remember that climate change is not uh, felt the same way over the whole planet. We have a geographic areas, we have biogeographic issues, we have species, landscape issues, seascape issues that, that come together to mean that some areas will be more strongly impacted, some areas might be more strongly negatively impacted, others might be relatively neutral, others might, be, might receive something of a benefit from this changed uh, condition. So for example right here, this is data from NOAA in 2016, just published just a little bit ago. <laughs> we'll see if this data re remains on the server in the next uh, year, but um, for now it's up there. Um, and uh, and what this is talking about different sea level uh, change over between 1960 and 2014. Note, this is what actually happened. This is not model data. This is actual quantitative measurement based data. And what we see is, um, you know, in most areas, sea levels, you know, went up and, and all that good stuff, but, but it wasn't equally uh, up uh, everywhere. In some areas, like, say, Louisiana, experienced uh, relative, and this is relative sea level rise. So in the case of Louisiana, we're also doing everything we can to destroy those wetlands by cutting off their sediment flow. So this is relative change. So that, those lands there are sinking in addition to the sea level rising up, up around it, which is why... Um, we see that in those places. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the history of climate change. This is one I think that is often not understood by the general public. And, and when we have uh, folks that have a particular political agenda quoting certain things, I think it's, it's easy to get misled. The first, um, and okay, so again, this background is in uh, relative change again, right? So this is this is deviation from the background. And so if we are at zero right here, that means, uh, it doesn't mean that the, the temperature is zero, it just means that um, relative to the background, there's uh, no obvious difference. And obviously as we go through time, we're seeing more and more uh, deviation as we saw before. So we see the first article, so really we get, this gets going in a big bad way with the Industrial Revolution. Right? We start burning coal in England and then discover the, the amazing energy concentration of fossil fuels and we start widely using those to fuel steel mills and power plants and all the stuff that has powered our modern industrial age. The first scientific article talking about the possibility of global warming was in 1896. So just to be clear, the first article, first scientific discussion of this was 1896. So when people claim that this is a new phenomenon or scientists have been studying for a little bit of time, that's not really true. We've been studying it intensively for a relatively short period of time. But this idea has um, been around for, for quite some time. Okay, uh, moving on forward. Now we're going, we're passing uh, World War II. Now you see that... that those videos I showed earlier, we talk about this, you know, great accelerator. 1950 is a convenient date just because it's a nice round number, but basically 1950 means post-World War II. After World War II, the, the powers reset around the world. We kicked into a, an even higher energy um, economy uh, globally, etc. So by 1950, we, we, we were noticing, or people were 
starting to think more about all this carbon we're pumping into the atmosphere, people thought, eh, primarily it's not going to cause a problem because the, the, the ocean is going to act as a sponge and is going to suck it up. Again, that notion that we've discussed about the ocean being this infinite thing, infinite fish producer, infinite pollution sucker upper, all that stuff. And so that was, that was going on uh, in the 1950s. Um, and then we have a, uh, some, some people starting to talk about some contrarian beliefs and start to get actual dialogue going on uh, climate change and on, on uh, what was happening, what wasn't happening. By 1970, we have the Clean Air Act, right? We talked about the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill and uh, the, one of the first things that come in the wake of that, in addition to NEPA and and the Environmental Protection Agency, et cetera, is the Clean Air Act. And that's something that in recent years we've brought to bear specifically to deal with CO2. And the Supreme Court has upheld the notion that um, we can use the Clean Air Act to manage, in other words, carbon dioxide and associated greenhouse gas uh, compounds are like lead or soot or any other potential pollutant in the atmosphere. Um, we have our first National Academy of Sciences panel, which is you know, an association of, of top scientists around the country get together and they make their first proclamation on climate change, start warning of it in the 1970s. We know now, I'm not going to go into this in this lecture, but we know now that the oil and gas industry took that, uh, those warnings to heart and they began changing their practices in terms of armoring and, and uh, protecting some of their coastal structures to deal with climate change. So even though some of those folks in that industry um, have felt that climate, have said publicly that climate change isn't really real or it's overblown, internally they were, they were acting like it was. So that I think tells you a lot. Um, and so, so this, this 1970s uh, panel was a, was a big, big thing. Um, we have first big international scientific conference on this topic in 1985. And uh, the first joint communication that we need to do something major is in 1987. It's important to say that across the, around 19, 1980s, we start to get the contrarian view, right? And this is very clearly fueled by the interests that, uh, not all entirely, of course, but a large number of folks that were in the employ of big tobacco and engaged in the disinformation campaign saying that cigarette smoking and tobacco use is not associated with elevated cancer risk, took almost identically the same playbook and they took it over to the climate change debate. And so they helped fuel this notion of uh, there's no credible evidence. There's no real, the real scientists aren't sure. There is, there is a debate. There is no debate. There is no debate. I would just I'll tell you that very, very honestly. I'm, I'm the one that always tells you guys, well, let's be careful. We don't know if that's true or not. I just, we're just finishing a survey for one of the professional scientific organizations I'm with. One of the questions I asked was the same one that we've asked with our public polling, right? We consistently get 70, 75 percent of the public say climate change is a serious threat we should deal with. When we ask the technical community, the scientific community, surprise, surprise, 100 percent of the scientists that we that took this poll, uh, primarily in California, um, in the West Coast, said that climate change was a significant problem. So this notion that there's a debate, there's anything, you know, no. There's more debate on whether uh, antibiotics actually kill bacteria than there is th as to whether climate change is actually happening. And that's important to say. But um, now these contrarian views were really big in the mid 90s. And so I just, for completeness, I list some of them for you. So they included things people said, for example, hey, the temperature record that you're talking about weather and what the temperature is, those stations are messed up because those stations aren't weren't evenly distributed across the planet and the historical data that you're, data that you're looking at are coming from, from cities where there's heat island effects, etc. 
We've now done extensive re-looking at, at data, including some climate skeptics from Berkeley and elsewhere, went and re-looked at that and looked at the data, and they found, actually, that's not true. They, they controlled for those factors. It, that does not explain what's going on. So that's, not, that's been put to sleep. You still hear people saying that. They're full of it. They're being intellectually dishonest with you. Next, sea level measurements are biased because the stations that we're using to measure, same thing, right? We, we don't have a, um, a random distribution of sea surface uh, measurements. Again, we've looked at that. People put a lot of time into crossing the T's and dotting the I's on this. And it, it's actually true. Sea level rise is going up even when we control for those issues. Initially, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the high water mark, that's a bad analogy, the, uh, the, the um, entity that we all quote from, that's our best global consistent source as to, uh, to climate science and the impact. Um, initially, they were really focused on scenarios, still are. And so there's been some critique of that saying, oh, that's all, scenarios aren't real science. Well, scenarios are being validated, and they do more than scenarios now. They do additional things. So that's not really valid. And then um, some uh, similar critiques, saying, oh, this thing hasn't been done, that thing hasn't been done. They actually have been now. So all of these things the contrarians have brought up, and some of it was true academics, intellectual rigor. Are you sure about this? And that's all good, and that's how we should proceed. But no one would walk into a room and tell you antibiotics are a big scam and antibiotics are all part of the pharmaceutical industry and antibiotics are a big a fake thing you shouldn't believe when people tell you to use antibiotics. We can have a discussion as to the appropriate level of antibiotic use and should we be using them in our cattle and things like that. Those are, those are totally legitimate. But uh, no one would say they don't actually work. Right? That's the level of misinformation that's coming out uh, uh, to you guys in the general public. And the implication is always, hey, we just want to study it more, which is baloney. Okay, so the early history of dealing with climate, with, with carbon emissions uh, starts in the late 80s in a big way, and it, it, it keeps, keeps going and going and going. Finally, in 1988, we established the IPCC, which is a joint uh, collaboration between the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment, Environmental Program. This is the entity that, along with Al Gore, wins the uh, Nobel Peace Prize um, a couple decades later. And we start to do international consensus building, an international discussion as to what's going on, let's measure what's going on, let's try to see if we can figure out, predict what's, what's happening. And we come out with the first so-called assessment. So we have, uh, every couple years now, we have a new assessment, which is a new report. Initially, the report was very simple and very focused on, on just the atmospheric issues. Over time, these assessments have gotten much more complex and have dealt with socioeconomic issues, uh, environmental <coughs> justice issues, ocean acidification, all these other components of a changed environment. But the first one came out in 1990. And then we had the Rio Summit. The Rio Summit established, established the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And, and we all adopted that. That's actually something of the framework we, the US, adopted. As crazy as that sound. We didn't, we didn't endorse the Biodiversity Treaty and other things, but we endorsed that. The most famous one that you guys know about, and then, so the, the COP is the Convention of the Parties. And this is where folks that are signatories to this um, uh, climate change convention get together and work on different components, right? So this, so this one here basically says, hey, we're going to get together and try to solve this. And then how we're getting together is in the form of these different, these different meetings. So the one you guys all know about is Kyoto. That was a subsection of this and the, the so-called Kyoto Protocol. Um, the 1992 summit, the goal there was to stabilize greenhouse gas 
concentration in the atmosphere. So let's not let it get any worse. And they had three guiding principles for that uh, policy that, that affected not just the coastal zone, but other things. Um, basically, everybody has responsibility here. And some people might be doing a little bit more because they have more capacity to do something. They have more money or more, more infrastructure or something. Emphasize precautionary measures. So again, this is early in some of the most robust science time period. So therefore, we're not sure exactly what's going to happen, but let's, let's go with the more cautionary approach, um, meaning we want to be more aggressive because we're afraid that our modeling is not sufficient and we're going to miss, we're going to underestimate what's going on. And also promoted this notion of sustainable development. The overall driving, driving commitment of uh, the 1992 convention was to return to 1990 levels of emissions by the end, uh, by, by 2000, by the millennium. And then there are all these separate requirements to report how much, how much carbon each of your countries are uh, contributing to the global atmosphere. When Kyoto comes around, that really solidifies some commitment on emissions. And, uh, and talks about what we do to comply and procedural rules. The US never adopted the Kyoto Protocol. So we, we were part of the negotiation, but that, that protocol was never adopted by the US Senate. Yeah? With the negotiation, the Senate wasn't involved with that part, where then we had just a Correct. then we tried to come back and... Right. So, so to clarify what Greg is saying, so all of these things, all of these international conventions, the Senate is not involved. They're, the executive branch has their representatives. Maybe it's a trade agreement, whatever it is. They go and they work out their, their uh, agreements. And then, and then our representative or representatives, depending on what the situation is, signs it. Right? And so that's the agreement. They all, all the countries finally, it might take them a long time, but when they, you know, TPP, for example, is a thing in the news now. right? So that was a lot of people worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. But um, the the ratification of that international agreement is in the purview of the US Senate. They don't see it until it's actually already been, uh, you know, the final document. And the final document comes in and we either thumbs up or thumbs down, right? So we can't, can't line item veto some things because all these other countries, they're, they have to vote on this, the identical, uh, you know, agreement, identical contract in most cases. Okay, most recently, so Kyoto's dead. Kyoto's run it is, is exceeded its lifespan and we never really adopt, we never adopted it. Um, so the Paris Agreement, the Paris Accords are the, were the current discussion. So those videos I opened with, those two videos, those were shown at the opening of the Paris uh, meeting. So the Paris Accord is essentially uh, dealing with, now some people would disagree with me, but I would say uh, it was basically dealing with the United States is primarily what it was about. Because people knew that the climate change deniers that, that are in power in our elected government would never support a, a, a traditional um, pact, a traditional international agreement. So um, the idea here is uh, very different. So the idea here is let's also notice before we were talking about emissions, before we were talking about concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we've, the conversation is switched. And now the main talking point is the global temperature increase. And no one talks about avoiding impact. Everybody agrees there's going to be impact. The goal is to avoid the worst of the worst possible impacts. And basically because of a lot of modeling, one, and two, because politicians aren't scientists and they can't keep complex ideas in their heads many times. The notion is you have to have an easy, an easy number to get their head around. We talked about that in terms of protection targets for MPAs. Same thing here, two degrees. Two degrees, everybody can understand two. Okay, let's go with two. Essentially is how we got there. And so, so the idea here is two degrees above pre-industrial levels, but also probably that's probably not good 
That's probably bad in and of itself. So maybe we should shoot for the 1.5 degrees, right? That might be good. So you can already notice it's a, there's a bit of him and Han, there's a bit of fluff in the, in the goals here, in the objectives. Um, notice what the objectives are. To increase the ability to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change. Foster resilience, all this and that, right? It's again, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's fluffy. It's, it's a little bit airy, right? Not, not super precise. A key thing here is acknowledgement that a lot of the poorest of the poor countries will have very, very, very limited capacity to deal with climate change, to make the kind of investments maybe in their energy sector or to do some coastal revetments, whatever it is. And so, so the notion is we have to have financial, we have to have ways of, of sending resources to the folks that don't have resources if we want them to respond. And this is how we get their buy-in to this uh, convention. Yeah, uh, Andy. Can, do you think that these poorer countries are going to start seeing trying to sue the bigger countries? For the Some are already starting to do that. Say, so you think it's going to be successful now? Or just no. No. I don't think it'll be successful. It's, it's um, primarily symbolic, I think, at this point. Because um, we haven't signed a convention. We haven't signed a law that says we will do this, right? So the, so the lawsuits are, are taking other tacks that, that, that this is essentially presenting a clear and present danger to their society or their country or their whatever. So that's a, it's a more difficult thing. If, if, if we had a law that says you can't emit X amount of carbon and we were, that would be a much more straightforward thing for those folks to, to do something about. Uh, Okay, so, act, so they want, well, we want to peak the emissions as soon as possible. We want to foster, and this is a really key thing, we want to foster fossil fuel. So people have talked about the, the, the Paris Agreement as essentially a rallying cry to divest from fossil fuels. So let's pull ourselves out. For the first time at this, in a big way, at this convention, there was business there a lot of large businesses. And they were saying, hey, climate change is bad for our business, so we're gonna do private investment as well on our side of the picture to try to, to get ourselves, wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. Um, right, okay. So in terms of the global agreements, the Kyoto Protocol had these real clear legal, you must do this or bad things would happen. Because the U.S. wouldn't sign on, and everybody knows the likelihood of them of of our elected representatives and the federal government signing on was nil. So Paris really talks about consensus building, right? So let's work on this as as t a team, a team type of thing. Um, and a lot of it focuses on voluntary and nationally determined uh, targets. So. Again, very different from a lot of our other international conventions on, you name it, on, on uh, illegal arms trading and, and the like. And again, this notion that we understand that the worst of the worst things cannot be avoided. And so the language used here, the, the new language is least developed countries. So this we're talking about small island nations in the Pacific. Uh, poor, low-lying countries like Bangladesh, etc., in Southeast Asia, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, what's going to what's going to happen with climate? So that, that was a little bit about the background of the policy, um, as relates to w what's going on here. California is different from federal policy, but but I'm only focused on federal policy here. Uh, but we have done a lot of uh, very innovative things, um, particularly spearheaded by Governor Schwarzenegger when he was our governor. Um, we, we have a, a, the, the Western States Alliance, so Oregon, Washington, California, and we have a lot of stuff that we're working on with joint agreements, et cetera, to try to facilitate the transition from fossil fuels into cleaner energy sectors, et cetera. All right, having said that, let's switch over to the, let's switch back to the ecological world, the natural world. Oh, so far, sorry, questions so far about those policies. 
This is, this is another happy lecture, I can tell. Everybody's super, to, no, no, stop stabbing yourselves, you guys will be okay. Be okay. All right, so uh, let's talk about what's gonna be, hap some examples of some of the things that are gonna happen, uh, that are happening with climate change that will continue to get uh, even more intense. So let's take some theoretical energy budget from some critter. Maybe it's a clam, maybe it's a crab, whatever. You can think about, one of, the, one of the basic ways to think about energy budgets in organisms is what are we doing with the sugars and the energies that we bring in? So some of it is just to do the, the maintenance on our bodies, right? To maintain our blood vessels and this and that. And that typically is the largest fraction. Uh, and then when we have some extra, once we've met all the cost of living, then we put the rest, some more energy into growth, to making our, our appendages longer and, and et cetera. And then if we have enough for cost of living and for growth, we'll also put uh, energy into reproduction, into making more of us, propagules, et cetera. When critters get stressed, this is what typically happens. So reproduction, I mean, this is, this is a bit oversimplified, but, but for the purpose of, of this discussion, so reproduction shrinks, usually first, and then growth shrinks, and we see a larger devoting of energy to just the maintenance. We see this when we're exposed to a toxin. We see this when critters are exposed to a more acidic uh, sea, etc. And in the context of ocean acidification, we can see a whole additional suite of um, changed physiology. So changed photosynthetic rates, changed uh, shell formation for organisms that lay down, especially calcium carbonate shells, either internally or externally. See changed respiration rates. See changed uh, balance of acid and base in their, in their um, internal systems. And then a general alteration of their metabolism in many cases. All signaling stress. So this is uh, Arctuthis. This is this is this, or this is actually a vampire squid. Excuse me. This is a vampire squid. It's a deep sea coral. Um, this is uh, the notion uh, again from our friends up at Ambari that it's not just going to be the shallow surface water. Sometimes we've been focusing on the shallow surface water. This is um, uh, depth. So again, this is the surface water going down deep, and this is pH. So this is more acidic, this is less acidic. And what we're seeing is uh, in the future ocean, we're gonna, everything's gonna be more acidic, not just the surface water. The surface waters will experience the greatest change, but the entire water column is changing. And we're seeing that these guys, that the, these organisms are being pushed out of their physiological norm. So does that mean these, all these critters are gonna die? No, it doesn't mean that but it means that they're gonna be stressed, right? And it's gonna, we either need to see some selection pressure for them to change, or they're gonna have a hard time. The problem is, one of the key things, if it's just respiration or something like that, that's bad, but we can probably recover. But if it is things like shell formation, that's basic chemistry. That's not something that can easily shift. So this is, this is a bad sign for some of these critters. Okay, so ocean acidification. So here's some data that is showing, again, our, our global atmospheric CO2 in red. It's been going up the hockey, the hockey stick. People call it the hockey stick model. I don't like that term, but that's what people call it. Um, and then the partial CO2, the amount of CO2 dissolved in the water is in the blue line. And again, we see that going up. And as that goes up, as we have more essentially acid in the water, the pH goes down. And this is the aragonite. This is the, um, does anybody work with Professor Dilly at all? Any of his projects? So Professor Dilly works on this a lot. Uh, so this is uh, a decreasing um, propensity to essentially be able to form calcium carbonate shells. Indeed, those of, so some of us that went with, uh, people that went with us to Hawaii, what are, the, what are we doing in, in the University of Hawaii's Hilo? Aquaculture facility, what, are the, what is one of the main things we're growing? 
Oysters, why? Why are we growing oysters in Hawaii? Because they filter the water. Oh, in Hawaii? Yeah, why are we growing them in Hawaii? Are they growing up the oysters in Hawaii? Uh, no. So they're growing the spat in Hawaii. Why are we growing the babies in Hawaii and then mailing them all to Washington and Oregon, etc.? Right, because right now during several times of the year, oysters can't even, the larvae cannot make shells. So there are no baby oysters being born in the wild in many stretches of the Pacific Northwest now. This is not 10 years in the future, this is right now. So these companies could not get their babies to start laying down shells, so instead they gave a bunch of money, shipped money out of their state, said a bunch of money to University of Hawaii Hilo, and they have a essentially oyster rearing facility there that pays for the grad, master's students doing their research. And they grow up these babies to a certain size, and then they ship them back to um, uh, the Pacific Northwest, where uh, once the shells have laid down, it's a little bit easier once you, you sort of start the process to, to get other shells la being laid down. But that's crazy. That's crazy. So that's in response to ocean acidification, that all, those, all that culturing we saw. Okay, so again, this notion that not all of the coast is the same. There's different, there's structure out there. There's, there's latitudinal structure. There's all kinds of different structure. Here's an example of <coughs> measurements for, uh, uh, north of Point Conception, me measurements south of Point Conception. And this is uh, uh, seawater temperature pH and then the partial CO2. And what we see is, surprise, surprise, it is warmer uh, here in Southern California. So the orange here is warmer in Southern California. Um, it's more acidic up north in, in Northern California, right? So this is lower pH here. And that's associated with a higher partial CO2. And this is only gonna be, and so right now, we're talking about failure or challenge of shell forming critters in the Pacific Northwest, but it's not gonna stay there forever. It's creeping down towards us. And so that's what you see illustrated here. So this is um, predicted surface water ocean, uh, uh, well, pH in 1750. So before the start of the industrial revolution. So relatively basic. Uh, and then a decade or so ago, Again, we see um, structure here, and notice that it's most intense close to the shore, close to the land. And then by 2050, we're seeing significant deviations in terms of the ocean acidity. It's gonna be very, very hard for a lot of our baby urchins and things like that to, to make shells um, and do their due. So hopefully they'll be able to adapt and, and respond, but it's gonna be a major stressor. It is a major stressor on these guys. Another thing that's important to note is all of these things, that I showed you guys some of those predictive models, some of those, that modeling on different scenarios. And you guys y'all gotta look at me on this one because this is an important thing that, that most people don't get. The IPCC is a consensus organization. I'll say that again. The IPCC is a consensus organization. The IPCC includes Russia. The IPCC includes India. The IPCC includes many folks that have been skeptical of various aspects of climate change. So when we generate these predictions, these are the conservative predictions. These are what Putin signed off on. These are what George W. Bush signed off on. So these are the estimates that everybody can agree upon. We have estimates that are much, show much greater water elevational rise, much greater temperature change, et cetera, but those things are scary, right? Those things are really scary and we're not sure. Again, all of this is based on modeling and we're trying to model the whole earth, right? The whole earth. And so that's a hard thing to model. 
changing atmospheric stuff, changing surface ocean. We have to do these on supercomputers. We do these simulations on, on these massive computing facilities because the computational uh, needs are just so great. So this notion that everybody keeps talking about, one meter of sea level rise, that's the conservative end of the modeling. Other modeling done at places like UC San Diego, et cetera, some of those models show much greater change. What we're seeing now, despite the, again, erroneous rhetoric that people are falsely putting out there in the media, what we're seeing is all of our predictions for how quickly things are going to be changing, things are changing way quicker than our predictions. The melting of glaciers, way faster than we thought, etc. So for example, here is some data of, sea, of uh, a surface temperature anomalies. In this case, this is September of 2012. And in many cases, this was matching the predictions for 2100. So the estimates from the IPCC shouldn't be taking, uh, we typically look at about them as a range. We take the IPC low estimate, IPCC high estimate, and we, we bound things. Um, that's not the bound of things. That's the bound of the things that everybody can agree upon. The other stuff is too crazy and too scary for folks to, to deal with. Um, but as you guys said, as we said before, the youngest life history stages, when we talk about things like ocean acidification, these are the stages that are most vulnerable. We're just little babies and we're just laying stuff down. That's where we have the least amount of physiological um, wherewithal to, to, to deal with the stress, etc. And all of these critters are going to have a hard time, especially in coastal California, especially as we go on uh, in the coming decades. Um, we're going to see species shifts. Right now, we don't fully understand what's going on. Guilds seem to be perhaps better ways to explain this. But long story short, here is some data about plants, mammals, uh, birds, um, etc., cetera, uh, dragonflies. There doesn't seem to be a consistent pattern necessarily in how these critters respond to climate change. Some change their range a lot. Others don't change their range much at all, or others sometimes can, you know, contract their range, expand their range. So there doesn't seem to be just one simple rule of thumb that everything necessarily goes north or goes to the top of mountains or whatever. Some of that definitely happens, but, but um, it's, it's difficult. So let's look at one, one specific example as to the kind of global weirding that we might get. So this is looking at a couple fish. So there's our friend cod and herring. And these are abundances. Mm. Excuse me, this is range extension. Um, oh, and this again, this is not model data. This is actually measured data. This is real data. OK, so what we see is cod um, in, in the Atlantic. We're, we're not talking about off California now. We're talking about uh, Atlantic Ocean, Mediterranean stuff. Um, what we see is cod over the 30, 40 odd years here, their range has been uh, shrinking. Herring has, has had, have experienced the opposite. Their range has expanded. I'm talking about latitudinal geographic range here. OK, so in the Baltic Sea, this is what we saw happen. This is one example of what we can see happening under a global weirded planet. So we had these. Uh, uh, so we have some fish. So this is in the Baltic, and this is a, a subsection of the Baltic. This is a particular area. And so we had um, uh, these guys, these, these fish eat the zooplankton, eat the copepods, and those guys in turn eat the plankton, right? So this is a trophic relationship. Well, when we started off, we didn't have cod. We had a fair amount of herring. Those herring ate the zooplankton. The zooplankton ate the phytoplankton. And I like that. Then what we had happen <clears throat> because of the range expansion, these guys came in. The cod started messing with the herring. The herring went down. The zooplankton increased there because they were essentially released from, from uh, predation pressure. And therefore, uh, the zooplankton, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, the phytoplankton uh, did better. So we're seeing these, these separation of... Uh, 
the, the abundances of critters are going up in different ways that maybe we wouldn't have predicted, right? So there's winners and losers here, and it's, it's complex. It's a complex web to untangle. Similarly, if we go back to, in this case, the Pacific Coast, um, we can see climate change messing with uh, the distribution of critters in other ways. So in this case, we're looking at barnacles up the top here. We're looking at mussels right here, and we're looking at starfish. Now recall that starfish are gonna eat these mussels, open up space that allows other critters like the barnacles to live. And this is the, the elevational distribution of barnacles, or excuse me, inter, the, inter, the, the elevational distribution of intertidal critters, excuse me. And so this is their, their mean and standard error back uh, in, you know, before we, any of us were born. Okay, so starfish are relatively low. They dry out if, it's, if they're super high. Mussels can hang out, can tolerate drying out a little bit better than can the, the sea stars. And then barnacles can, have, or can withstand drying out even better than the, than the mussels. This is what happened. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, so temp, average summer temperature in the intertidal has been going up, 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 up. And what we see is we see a shift in the distribution of these critters. So check it out. So, so the, um, uh, where's my pointer here? Here we go. So the starfish, sea stars, have pretty much stayed more or less the same. They haven't really gone up. The barnacles are actually going down slightly. And, and in other words, they're occupying lower areas. And so are the mussels. So what that's saying is that we're, we're getting, um, starting to lose some of our muscles, et cetera, because the space, right? They were, at, they were able to operate in this big space here without anybody around. Now these guys are squishing together. Can you see it? These guys are squishing lower. These guys are staying the same, if not going a little teeny bit higher. So the, the ecological space in which these guys can operate is getting shrunk. So those are the kind of interactions we're, we're seeing. Okay. Let's take a look a little closer to home. So these are uh, some examples you guys can play with. There's several choices now. We, we were helped uh, the Nature Conservancy do the first one of these here in Ventura's Coastal Resilience Project. Um, and NOAA now has viewers, um, uh, all these different uh, cool things. This one's from Climate Central. Um, they all show basically the same thing, but let's just take a look at one of these guys and see um, what's gonna be going on in our neck of the woods. That looks pretty good. Okay, so we're gonna look at sea level rise. Or do you guys want to? Do you guys want to see Ventura too, or no? You guys want to just want to focus down here. You want to see Ventura too? Oh God, okay, mine. All right. Um, okay, so there we go. So there, here's our coast. So here's here's campus right here. Here's Magoo. Here's Ventura. So there we go. Yeah, the, obviously the Oxnard Plain. So this is with with increased temperature, and therefore associated melting, etc this is gonna be areas that are inundated. So we can step up to ha half a degree temperature increase. So these areas now are essentially subtidal. So these are our, wet, our current wetlands. We're starting to see, uh, so that's in around Magoo Lagoon and Cayugas Creek. We also see that at um, Santa Clara River Estuary. Go up to one degree temperature rise and we start to see all this area inundated, essentially permanently. And then we start to see all the area around Port Wyneme, et cetera, go uh, subtitle. And then the areas around Santa Clara River Estuary grow. Um, Ventura Harbor area around there grows. Okay, and, and so, and this is what the translation is in terms of feet, right? So this last one, this was plus seven feet, right? Which is, if you, if you look at the, the conservative modeling, this is about twice what these guys would say. Yeah, Danielle. Uh, sorry, no, up in the, uh, up in the air, uh, uh, elevational seven feet. And is that above average tide height? So this is, at, this is sort of year round average. So the stuff that we did with the Nature Conservancy actually models uh, storm surge on top of a high tide and looks at habitat conversion, but, but that's, that was a slightly more complex model. Um, it was a sailor automaton model. But um, so 
So yeah, so we see this. So boom, boom, boom. This is what everybody is, is saying we have to hold ourselves to, right? So this is what everybody is working towards. Not making better than this, not letting it get any worse than this. So if we have a look, here's Petrero Road, right? Here's campus. Let's see if we zoom in a little bit. Okay. So that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about waters either all the time or during high tide with 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 inundation etc a lot of salt water right a lot of salt water so and i don't want to get on my my horse or anything but uh some of the folks we've been trying to per so our ormond beach salt marsh restoration is going to win i'm completely confident it's going to win we've been trying to purchase land from uh, some of our surrounding farmers for a while and they're holding out because they would like more money, which is totally understandable, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we're going to win. I think, I think the sea is going to bat last. And so um, it would be great if we could get these lands sooner rather than later to design our restoration to better adapt and evolve with changing climate. But it's going to happen. One of, the, one of the few upsides with this is here in the Oxnard Plain, unlike most of California, this is, this is just farmland, flat farmland. So as the water comes in, as the coastline changes, as, the, as uh, the, the salt water and the sea spray comes in more and more, this is going to convert to salt marsh. This is going to convert to dunes. This is going to convert to coastal strand community. There are no, there are no hard walls. There are no... 15 miles of solid urbanization. There is no line in the sand that is PCH that we cannot let fall or something of that nature, right? So therefore, it, we're gonna be relatively okay. Now the question is, are we gonna have contaminated soils and things like that, but it, it's, not as, it's not as bad as many places which are experiencing that so-called coastal squeeze and that here our systems will evolve. Now, do the farmers that are farming right here believe that right now or are they completely internalize that risk? I don't, I don't think so. And is this going to happen next week? No. Is it going to happen 10 years from now? Probably not, right? But, but you start to get in this guessing game as to when is this going to happen, right? When is this going to happen? Yeah, Danielle. Are the islands, the islands are going to be pretty much okay. Let's take a look. What do you want to see, Santa Rosa or something? Oh, I don't think Santa Rosa, no, I don't think... Yeah, I don't think we have these modeled on here. Maybe we do. Maybe we do. Initially, we didn't. Let's see. Yeah, I guess they're on here. So Skunk Point is gonna go is gonna go subtitle. Surprise, surprise. But you know, our our, mo our islands are so up and down. There's really not a huge amount of aerial extent that'll be lost. Andy. Are there predictions on the? There's so many assumptions that go into that. No, I mean, I mean, there's there's best guesses. I mean, like let's let's take a look here. Let's look at this. So the question was, do we have mo do we have estimates on on change pollutant loads? And that's really going to be hyper dependent on on what we do. Now have a look, right? So if we look over here, right here's Santa Barbara, right here's downtown Santa Barbara. Now this is incredibly expensive, but where are we going here? This is incredibly expensive, but downtown Santa Barbara is flooding through a re really narrow place, right? Really narrow place. That's a, in theory, defensible place. You could build a seawall there. I mean, I don't know if I want to be living underneath that when the seawater sees, sees higher, but still, that's at least, it's going to be, it would be massively expensive. But you could talk about that. In the Oxnard Plain, no way. No, no way, Jose. It, it's, just, it's just way too massive. Oh, sorry, here's Santa Barbara. I was, I was, I was looking at Goleta, I guess. This is Santa Barbara. Um, but, but look at the Oxnard Plain, right? The Oxnard Plain, 
is you know miles and miles and miles and there is no pinch point there is no little gate we could close as it were so that's that's the situation we're dealing with in terms of coastal uh loss now the other thing is let's look at uh, miami Okay, so here, let's zoom out a little teeny bit. Now, m most of you guys have never been to Florida, and uh, but this is the southern tip of Florida. This is the Ever Everglades is here, etc. Right, all the good stuff. Florida is one dead, big giant dead coral reef. It's all calcareous soils. They're all, uh, you know, they're not like our land where we think of this you know lava came up and then it was hard rock this is essentially dead seashells that we've built this uh, this peninsula is built on so we, I showed that picture earlier of the flooding right coastal flooding and, and that reporter was speaking to candidate Trump about about what his opinion was and everything he's like well you know I don't know I guess it's okay so this is what's gonna happen here half a degree one degree. Miami's already toast here. A degree and a half. Two degrees. So this, recall this. Let's slip back a little bit. This is the goal, right, of the aggressive people under the Paris Agreement. If we go any higher than this. There is no South Florida anymore. Again, you need to make sure you understand the facts here. This is the end of the process. The start of the process is right now. Water tables are being contaminated as we speak in Miami-Dade County. So it's all porous ground. So as the sea rises, even before it gets to this really high level, we're seeing seawater contaminate the freshwater drinking sources of many of the, the folks in South Florida. So that's a huge deal. Colleagues that I know, I won't say anybody's name, I don't want to out anybody, but I'll just say some colleagues I know from Florida, professors, have sold their houses. So they now rent. It's very clear to me that how this is going to go down is it's not going to be something of oh my gosh the water gets a little higher this week oh my gosh the water gets a little higher this week things are going to go down like new orleans in my humble opinion there's going to be something something's going to critical boom it's going to go and all of a sudden it's going to go very fast so my colleagues in florida understand this so they still like living in florida they still like mayonnaise on their sandwiches and you know pink flamingos and stuff um, they um, they understand that when push comes to shove, it's going to be it's going to be difficult to get out. Right now, Miami has one of the most expensive real estate markets in the country. Coastal real estate, uh, what do we call it? What's the beach? Um, you guys should know. You're young. <laughs> Not Daytona. No, in Miami. What's the um, South Beach? South Beach. South Beach. Right and all the models and all that kind of stuff, right? Incredibly expensive real estate. Almost all of, or not almost all of which, that's not a fair statement, a very large proportion of which is overseas investments. Because people see America as a stable economy now in this crazy world that we're in. So if you just look at the real estate folks, if you just talk to the developers, life is great. People are investing insane amounts of money for these high-rise apartments. They're not even necessarily living there, right? It's a, it's a financial investment to, to park their money in places where they can't maybe get good interest in banks. So that's artificially propping up the real estate in South Florida. So at some point, something's gonna happen. Maybe it's gonna be a hurricane. Maybe it's gonna be a series of really high tides and what have you. 
Um, now, Miami routinely floods at king tides. Water is getting tight. As soon as these folks start pulling out of that real estate market, uh, I predict that there's going to be some rapid change in South Florida. Now, whether that happens this year or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, I can't say for sure. But I guarantee that within 50 years, there's not going to be the city of Miami the way the city of Miami is now. And those are the challenges that we're facing. Are we comfortable with losing that tip of our country? Maybe we are. Maybe some people are. But those are the, those are the real risks that we're facing. The number one threat the U.S. Naval War College used to game was, uh, was you know, terrorist attack and, and, and dirty bomb and all this kind of stuff. Now the number one scenario the U.S. Naval War College games is climate change induced disaster. In a place like Bangladesh, in a place like some low-lying, deltaic, uh, heavily populated area, and again, New Orleans is a fantastic model, I would suggest, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina for what happened. New Orleans was in a very wealthy country, right? The wealthiest country in the world, the most powerful country in the world. And what happened, right? That city sunk. People couldn't get their stuff together. It was chaos. We had to have Royal Canadian Mounted Police bring water down to give water to our citizens three days before the National Guard showed up. In the US, what do you think is going to happen in a country where you have millions of people living below sea level? And I mean, it's, it's going to be bad. And so that's, that, that's, those are the scenarios that we game, right? And so that's the, that's the real thing we're talking about here. We're not talking about saving polar bears. We're talking about saving our, our functioning society. Okay. Wow, I'm, I'm bumming everybody out. I gotta be careful. So you're saying invest in desalination in the future? Invest in desalination in the future. So, we're, so various things that we're already starting to see are species shifts, as we mentioned. Certain, certain critters in, in, in coastal mountains and inland mountains going high to higher elevations. We're seeing uh, phenological changes where things like fish that spawn during a certain time of the year, they're shifting. They're sh and this is not, again, this is not modeled. We do have models to show this. This is measured data. We have a project on our, has anybody worked on Dr. Monsma's um, uh, phenology project? Okay, right, so just over the, whatever we've been doing that, eight years or whatever it is, in terms of wildflower flowering times here it, on campus, we've seen, now it's hard to know from just that small subset if that's really, real everywhere else, but when we look at the other bud burst data from around, it sure as heck seems like it's a robust pattern. So we're seeing uh, plants flower at different times, fish migrate at different times, again responding to the altered conditions. The problem is these fish have been cued or, or have evolved to deal with, and other critters, warmth. Rainfall, warmth, these triggers, right? That's what they've evolved with and they know when it rains that you should go swim over here or climb up that thing or whatever. We're seeing decoupling of these signals. So now our fish might move up. Our fish might think, oh my God, it's time to go, time to go listen to Barry White and stuff like that, right? But the insects might not know that. So when these critters m start their migrations or their, their movement or the reproduction or whatever, all the other pieces of the jigsaw, they might move with them. They all might shift in, in concert. But or we're seeing fairly common is, is not all the pieces of the puzzle come along. And these critters need all the pieces of the puzzle to complete their life history. So they're getting these signals to move, to grow, to change as if it's one condition. But when they go to do those actions, they're actually finding a different environment, a suboptimal environment less food, less protection from predators, whatever the case may be. Uh, we see it with butterflies, like the butterfly that I worked on up, at, up in the Bay Area. Um, we're seeing a lot of shifted ranges in birds. So uh, more than half of the birds that we have in Central California, songbirds, the Passeriformes, um, have shifted um, 
ranges and, and are, are coming at different times. Again, this is not theoretical. This is what we've observed. So when people say things like we've, well, you know, this climate change stuff, I, want it, I don't see it. It's because they're idiots, quite honestly. They're looking, they're being ignorant. They're not using all of their faculty. They're not using all their senses. And it falls on us as observers of the natural world to help point this out to our, our colleagues and help our friends and our family and, and the general public. Perhaps the most useful thing to talk about, talking about the bird shifting, talking about the fish shifting, a lot of people, no, nah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So one of the stories I always tell is my, uh, one of my neighbors who um, didn't really believe climate change and everything and this and that. He's like, oh yeah, well, I don't know, man, the birds, yeah. When I started talking about the impact on wine, like, wait, what? He drank a lot of wine. Like, what are you talking about, right? So we're talking about shifts throughout society, even though we mostly focus on the coastal zone and, and organisms and flooding and things. But we're going to see change production. There will be some winners. The Mendocino Coast, the coast north of San Francisco, is going to become more optimal for wine growing. <coughs> places like Temecula, places like you know, the, more of the southern parts of the state, are going to become pretty hard to grow grapes. Not impossible, but harder. Napa, the massive production area of the Napa Valley, it's not going to go away entirely, but it's going to become harder for them to grow. One of the great things that we can do as ESRM folks is we can help interpret this to the public, right? And you can do it in scary ways, like I was just doing today, probably freaked everybody out. You got to go slit yourself. But you guys are thinking about these challenges. You should be thinking about these challenges as an interdisciplinary crisis. How can, we, how can we have this conversation with folks, right? We can talk about wine production. We can talk about the lost, air, lost amount of surf breaks that we otherwise would have, right? Those kinds of things. But also, you guys, in particular, can use your cool interdisciplinary skill sets and do things like, uh, like this. So this is a uh, colleague of ours that unfortunately passed away um, a year and a half ago was, was hit by a drunk driver. But this is a picture with the then president of the US, Bill Clinton, Al Gore, in 1998. We had this ocean summit meeting in Monterey. And, uh, and, and these two students are out there. Rafe is here on the left um, uh, and, and Nancy is on the right. Um, are giving a tour to our president and vice president in an MPA, in a marine protected area at Hopkins Marine Lab, Hopkins Marine Station. And he's explaining to these guys what is uh, about intertidal ecology and all this and that, and that's cool. Um, and we'll talk about that in one, in one second. But essentially they've relocated. So in here was an undergraduate research project. <gasps> How interesting. Undergraduate research project from the 1930s, where we knocked a transect into the, you know, started a transect in the high intertidal and ran it down into the shallow subtidal. And the students, just like you guys, just like we do when we do the sand crab monitoring, just like we do when we do our roadkill monitoring, just like we do when we do our beach monitoring, all those things, same exact deal, go out, measure it. And these, so we have data from this particular site. Indeed, there's a postdoc now that's trying to go back. And she's one of the main things she's doing is reading undergraduate theses that are at the library there. She's pulling up these undergraduate theses, and she's looking at these things. And she's going, hey, did somebody look for something like limpet, something that we could easily count now, that I have a high confidence, even if the undergrad was a little silly or whatever, they, easy to see. They probably did a good job of surveying the critter. And then they're going back and they're repeating those surveys. So we have this decades-long record of what the critters have been like in the rocky intertidal. And that sh has shown a shift. We've seen southern species come in. And, and in some cases, uh, so critters that are more distributed south of Monterey, some of those have come in. 
And some of the ones that were north of Bonneray have left, and they've shifted their species distribution farther north. So probably responding to warmer water. Another example, this one over here, also by Rafe, over here on the uh, right-hand side, this is um, non-traditional data sources, something that you guys excel at finding and working on, and we really like a lot. So in this case, this was, this is this town in Alaska that uh, go and they get, um, they would have bets, because it's Alaska, and what else are you going to do, right? So they have this river that freezes through the town every year. And so they go out, they go out, and they establish this tripod, right? And then they take bets in, you know, in the early winter time. They take bets on when, what day of the year we think this, the, 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 uh, it's going to be so warm and the river's going to melt and this, 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 tra this um, teepee basically is going to fall into the river, right? And everybody puts in a couple bucks and it's a, it's a fun game. But they've been doing this for almost 100 years. So that's, an that's a really unique measure of climate change, right? So if the things are getting warmer and warmer, we should start to see the date by which this, uh, this structure falls in the river happen earlier and earlier. And surprise, surprise, that's what we see, right? Fantastic way to talk about climate change, right? That gets around all the stuff about people saying, well, I don't know about the fish and I don't care about the birds, right? But also, it's, it's, a, it's a place for scholarship that you guys could work on. So uh, sticking with that idea, this is uh, John Steinbeck and his friend Ed Ricketts. They um, like to drink a lot and uh, do fun things. And so essentially, um, Ricketts convinces Stein. So Ed Ricketts is a naturalist, starts a Pacific Biological Lab, the first place that would sell around the country urchins and sea cucumbers for high school dissections and things like that. It made his living going down. The basis for the character Doc in Cannery Row and other, other uh, books uh, uh, that Steinbeck wrote. And so essentially, they wanted to have a bro trip and they got a sailboat and they sailed down the coast of Baja and they sailed around the tip of Baja and up into the Sea of Cortez and they very precisely recorded what they saw recorded what they saw, where they saw it, which snails, which crabs, etc. So um, these guys retraced, the, did the same exact voyage a couple years ago. You know, six, six decades or so later and retraced in the same thing, right? So we compared what was where back then, what was where now. So these kinds of unique ways of looking at climate impacts and in communicating stuff, that's in your purview. That, that, that's totally within your guys' realm. And there's a million possible ways to have more effective conversations with people. Maybe it's around surf spots. Maybe it's around skiing. Maybe it's around wine drinking. Maybe it's around, I don't know, laying around the beach, right? And the value of our beaches and all those different things. So those are all different ways to talk about climate change in ways that maybe are a little bit less scary and or maybe ways that could get more purchase with uh, the general public. Because again, I don't think most people want to see the planet destroyed. I think most people are caught up in some silly us versus them rhetoric. And we need examples like the vineyard, like surfing, like Alaskans betting on a thing that's going to fall into a river to break us out of that silliness on both sides, a lot of silliness. There's a lot of thinking that these folks are stupid and these other folks are trying to trick us and da 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 da. So these types of ESRM interdisciplinary approaches, I think is how we're gonna get ourselves out of this, this climate uh, craziness. So uh, I can show more examples, some blue in the face, but I think you guys get the idea. So the major issue that you guys should take away from this is one, climate change is a serious threat that we're facing. The effects of climate change are not going to be felt equally, you know, the, the same all over the planet. There's going to be some areas that get wetter, some areas that get drier, some areas that get warmer, some areas that get colder, right? That's why I think the term global weirding is the correct term. We are going to see 
increasing rates of change. What, whatever those changes are, they're gonna be happening quicker and quicker and quicker. And the question is, are, is, are our biological communities and are our social systems up to the task of adapting to increasingly rapid change? If there weren't a massively transformed landscape and we increase the temperature, ah, these barnacles would just shift, shift up the coast or whatever, or these birds would just go a little more inland or whatever it is. But our overlay of humanity across the planet has really complicated the ability of critters to adapt and indeed the ability of, of us to adapt. We have an increasing array of tools like these free online viewers that you can look at or anybody can look at to look at some of the things that are relatively easy to visualize. Things like sea level rise, coastal inundation, that kind of stuff. These threats are huge, but the good news is it's within our power to do something about this, right? It's within our power to do something about this. So the notion that we're totally disem disempowered and we can't do anything is baloney, right? Our state leads the nation in terms of proportion, the amount of renewables. And we are pushing to use fewer fossil fuels, more renewable sources of energy uh, in, in a big bad way. Now we could be doing it faster, but the standards that we set oftentimes are the standards that get rolled out around the rest of the country. If we're talking about fuel efficiency standards, if we're talking about hybrid cars and the things like that. That's one of the reasons why the automotive industry, the oil and gas industry so frequently fight regulations in California, because they know that as the largest state, as California goes in many cases, so goes the rest of the country. It's also important to re remember that, and sometimes we're in the bubble here, the bubble of California, the bubble of the US, the rest of the world does not, there's nowhere near this, this disagreement on climate change, right? They might disagree on the best way to, the best a tactic to take, but people don't waste their energy screaming that this thing doesn't exist. So take heart in that. And uh, I would also say, uh, engage with people with these conversations. So when you go home for Christmas, and you go home and talk to your crazy uncle who's a freak, and voted for someone that doesn't believe in climate change and thinks that's just fine, talk with him. Talk with her, right? Engage in these conversations. Have a good time. Go drink with them, right? I'm not, I'm not saying get drunk. That, I wouldn't imply that because that's like inappropriate or something. But I'm saying, but have fun with them, right? Don't take this thing so seriously that it's like a life and death conversation. Even though you, it might seem like it's life and death, let's engage with folks that can't see reality. Let's engage with folks that don't understand the facts and share that with them. Because I think it's bullshit, the world that you guys are inheriting and that my son is inheriting. And I don't like that. And we, sh we have the power within us to change stuff, but if we get all depressed and super sad all the time, it's not gonna work. So it is key to engage. And, and engaging not with me and not with us, because we are pretty much generally speaking on the same page. It's rather engaging with folks that maybe don't see the problem in as stark terms as, as we might. Cool? All right. Woo! What a happy talk. What a happy, happy, happy.